Well, oh, it's noon. Shall we get started? I think we should. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development at One Schoolhouse. And joining me here is Peter Gao. Peter, do you want to hi. introduce yourself and I'll get the slides going? Sure. I'm Peter Gao. I'm the uh, Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse. And we're both very happy to be with you today. This has uh, been quite a spring and we've learned a few things and we want to share those those learnings with you and also then find out if there's anything more at the end. We'll take some questions if there's more stuff that we need to learn and can be helpful with. Great. So if you're in the chat, will you just say hello and maybe where you're from? And um, so I think I shared my slides successfully. I usually do it in a different order. So if you can't see the slides, will somebody holler fast and I'll check that and fix it. Um, so Peter, what we thought we would do today is think about this course that we have been teaching for a while here at One Schoolhouse, um, or at least it feels like a while. We started in May, which seems like a really long time ago, doesn't it? Unbelievable long time, yes. Yeah. So we have a course called Academic Leadership for Hybrid Learning, and we just finished up the last section. And so in looking back, we had over 800 participants representing well over 500 schools. We generated at least 2,500 discussion posts, and I have no way to count how many students were represented. So I stuck the infinity symbol in there. So do you feel like we had a good cross-section of independent schools, Peter? I think we did from large to small, from uh, all kinds of missions, boarding day, all over the country and really all over the world, in fact. And I would say that post number is off by a factor of um, at, at least, um, I, I think they're probably closer to 6,000, Sarah, <laughs> as I do the math on my fingers here. Yeah. I think you're right. I think I counted at the minimum number times the participants to get the badge, but I did not. So I'm going to just say right <laughs> I don't have a PhD. I'm not a data scientist. So this is Sarah's interpretation of not a um, not a thorough analysis, but I think we would love to go back through. But this is just, just some stuff and we want to leave some time for questions. So Sarah, quit your ring. And so I'm going to tell you um, kind of how we got going as one of the things we did is we asked people to tell us about their spring, right? And so this was the um, not it was great. That's actually the wrong way to say it. But I think people really expressed that our community rallied and we rose to the occasion and we're exhausted and we can't do it like that again. Would you say that's, that came through? I think that's exactly the message that we heard. Yeah, that it, and, and there were a few people who, you know, great in terms of better than what normal would have been. No, but there were, uh, you know, some people who were quite, you know, satisfied under the circumstances with what their school and their faculty were able to achieve. So Yeah, and I think, so one of the things that came through that we'll talk about in just a second is a distinctor and some, I know I talk about tech a lot. It's sort of part of my, um, how I operate, but the, the tech teams just came through for schools, you know, and I say they delivered, and I mean literally. Tech people were driving around cities, delivering devices to kids and hotspots, just making sure that everybody could get on. And so I think that was, um, it was a silver lining. Mm -hmm. So the top differentiator that we saw when schools said, you know, we managed and we rallied versus, oh gosh, there's some things we struggled with, were that unified learning management system. If they had one, and I'm going completely agnostic here, I'm not saying that you know this one worked better than that one, or we like brand X, Y, Z, just if you had one and everybody was already using it, it made the transition easier. If you didn't have one, or if everybody was using a different one, or heaven forbid, there were several in play and there were some battles going on between you know this one is better or that one is better, schools struggled. And then, so this is it. 
<laughs> Go, Peter. Uh, I, I want to I want to steal this slide because this is Sarah's rather brilliant observation is that in fact your learning management system whether it's you know Google Classroom or Blackboard or Moodle or whatever it might be does anybody still use Moodle that this becomes the physical stand-in for your school that as the as the channel the main channel for communication between a school and a student and their family this is what you know, you don't log into, you don't drop the kid off at school, you log into the LMS because the LMS is where school lives. Um, and that's a, a level of importance that I don't think anybody quite understood before all this began, except possibly Sarah, who sees things hmm. that are real. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for adding that. So I think the other thing is we don't throw up in the doors and say, hey, kids, find a room and hope that that's where fourth grade is going to be today. We say, this is your teacher and this is where you go in your classroom. And we give kids structure and predictability because we know that's what they need to feel safe. And so when we think about the things that cause friction, and we're going to talk about that later. So if I don't know where to turn in my homework assignment for Mr. Gao's class, because he does it differently from anybody else, then I think mean old Mr. Gao, he doesn't want me to succeed in class. And that sets up a relationship that is not what we want. And that leads us right into what stays the same when we're online. And that's that independent school teaching is about relationships. And we heard that over and over again this summer in the leadership course that we really want to support the relationship between teachers and their students. That's our fa the foundation for our school. And, and the key to those relationships is communication. Uh, and here's something else to think about. And we, we learned this and some schools and teachers probably learned this lesson in a very hard way is that when kids are at home with caregivers looking over their shoulder, school is theater in the round. And when Mr. Gao messes up somehow, it's not just a matter of frustration for the kid, it's a matter of frustration for the family after the kid shares their frustration. And then they discuss the whole thing again at dinner. Um, and by the time a couple of these you know, bad incidents have passed, Mr. Gao is, is a joke in the household. So how can Mr. Gao do better? Well, Mr. Gao needs to learn to communicate more effectively. Um, Mr. Gao needs to use video to introduce himself, perhaps, if school is going to be all or mostly online. There need to be clear expectations set. Uh, one of the things that our one schoolhouse classroom teachers do, uh, we're moving into this, thank you. No, um, because it just matches what you're saying there. If I'm getting ahead here, let me know. Uh, if, uh, one of the things that our one schoolhouse teachers do is they have one-to-one -one goal setting meetings with kids um, at the beginning of a course and then during the course periodically. And those create a relationship and these can be done just as easily uh, over Zoom or whatever your medium might be to, you know, what do you want out of the learning? And hey teacher, what can you give me? How can you help me and support me? So these become important parts of a relationship that continues in, right from the beginning. Yeah, it takes some time, it takes a little tech know-how, but it can make things very different. So that's one thing we learned. And the other thing we learned is that, well, and again, this is sort of learning we, we get from our own teachers who teach the um, school courses, is that giving feedback to students is also a really important kind of communication and it's a communication that builds relationships. So if you are the teacher who sits on a pile of papers for weeks on end, and there might have been a time when I did that myself, um, then you're l missing an opportunity to connect with your students to show them how you're how you want to support them. And it's not just the grade, it is feedback that's required here. So that's, those are really obvious things that schools and teachers can do to keep those relationships going, as well as just whenever there's an opportunity to inter interact with kids and families, be yourself. The yeah. basic rule of teaching, be yourself. Don't be the teacher. 
So the only thing I'm going to interject here. So when I say Mr. Gao, you're supposed to say Ms. Hanwald. When that Ms. Hanwald becomes a topic of, so <laughs> he's just not a, a pilot Peter as the example of, of what. I thought you were at a progressive school where we use first names, that's all. Well, no, you can do either one. I just don't want it to always be you. So something else that we learned, and we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit more later, is that academic leadership is under pressure. This is a high pressure moment. And, you know, it's not enough to have a pandemic, right? So there's also an opportunity here to really think about how are we going to look at who we are as schools. And I'm just going to apologize. Um, these are the slides in this are not in the same order. I'm looking ahead, Peter, and seeing that. But there is a lot on your plate as an academic leader right now. And I don't know if you feel like I've missed something, if you want to put it in the chat and I'll save the chat and we'll add that on. But so let's look at some of the things that we know academic leaders are dealing with. We don't have solutions for you because they're going to be very school-based, but we have some thoughts about maybe some questions that you might want to ask on campus and some ways you want to think about things. So, the first one is we need new systems for social emotional support. And this is for everyone, the children and the adults. Um, I went to look for this article about quarantineagers and oh my gosh, it seems so long ago that we were worried about kids missing their prom and how we would be supporting them emotionally during that time. And now we see pictures from schools preparing to set up kindergarten so that if a child falls and breaks into tears, a teacher is not supposed to scoop that child up and give them a hug. Um, so our whole social emotional programming is based on proximity. We are in physical proximity with our students. And so that is how we know when they need more support. And we're gonna have to rethink those. And then our proximity to the adults on campus, right? We have a good feel for making sure that administrators peek in at the new teacher, even if that teacher's an experienced veteran and just saying, hey, I'm here if you need me. And, you know, thinking about our very first teaching job teachers, how are we supporting them? And then thinking about people who are going through certain struggles. We need to know faculty like we've never known them before. And we've got faculty who thrive on the the extroverted classroom and being in contact with their students, the ones who are the legendary storytellers who kids wait for years to get and who are now at home and realizing that their stories aren't coming across on Zoom the way that they do in the classroom when they can hold, hold a class in their palm. So that leads to something called the platinum rule. And I've referred to this before. Jane Kyes does a lot of work on coaching and she says that the golden rule where we treat people as we would like to be treated is not really what we need to do. Instead, we need to treat others in the way they, she says, would like, and I would say need to be treated, which means that we need to know them. We need to know, are they at home with two parents who are in assisted living, a partner who's an essential caregiver and three children under six, right? And how does that teacher need support while teaching via distance versus the person who's maybe completely alone. They may in some ways be envious of each other and yet those are two really challenging situations. Peter, what do you wanna add here? I would like to add that, you know, in, in many schools, there is a, a culture and I don't know whether it's necessarily, a, 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 I don't necessarily think it's a good culture, but a, a culture, uh, where teacher autonomy means administrators tend to leave teachers alone, um, possibly because they are uncomfortable having difficult conversations or, you know, offering directions or advice to teachers. And this culture of autonomy means that for, you know, many teachers, certainly in my early career where this was very much the case, I was alone in my classroom. Uh, if anybody knew me and knew what was going on in my classroom, it was kind of accidental uh, or I was in trouble and some administrator had to come and look and see what I was, whether I was reading aloud to my students. Um, 
that actually happened. But so this is where knowing your teachers involves knowing them personally, understanding their situations, also knowing their goals as teachers. Maybe those goal setting meetings that uh, we talked about with teachers and students could also be, and at some schools they are a thing, and that's great, but if goal setting meetings are not a part of your school's culture, maybe this is a time to think about adding them to build in that conversation about what's going on, because that's where the backstories are going to emerge, and that's what's going to be the important part of getting us all through this year. So uh, really supporting teachers as human beings, supporting teachers as teachers, supporting teachers as members of the community. So I just want to say, Peter, it's, we might call it autonomy, but that's really neglect, I think. Absolutely. Really yes. Neglect. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Um, and so something I want to point out, if you happen to look at the participants here, you'll see that there's a Zoom administrator in the room with a nice little friendly icon. And that's a way for someone to be present, but not obtrusive in an online classroom. And so that's my administrator <laughs> in my case. And I know who it is behind there. And I think that's something that everybody else can kind of norm as a part of, oh, this is somebody who may pop in and out of the class and that's the symbol, but it's not the uh, division director's face popping in randomly into the classroom. Instead, it's you know more subtle than that. And I think, nor, oh, go ahead. Nor, nor is it Oz the Great and Powerful. It's not Big Brother, it's just somebody popping in to see how things are going. Right, and so that's a presence that you can have as a leader. And I think the reason it feels so personal for academic leadership right now too is that you're mission driven, right? You believe in the mission of your school and so when you are anxious and you have questions about how are we gonna do this online, it's because you really care about how you're gonna do that. So in line with treating others the way they need to be treated, and that requires that you really know them. And one of the things that we know more so now than ever before is that we have got to dismantle structural, raci raci structural racism in our schools. And that means that we have to really understand ourselves. And this is something that's coming through over and over again in our courses is that leaders are asking these questions. How am I going to wrestle with these topics, especially when I can't sit down together with a group of teachers? And so often it's a matter of looking deep and hard at your school's articulated mission and values. Are you really living those? Are you living those at a level that puts them above where they should be above the, uh, the, the mere business of curriculum and pedagogy and, and assessment and all that. Your mission, your values are a promise that you make to your community, to the parents and kids at your school. And if you're not understanding those and looking at them as, you know, a, a, these are principles of social justice, every single one of them. And if you're not living up to those, think again, because social justice is more important than algebra two or English or history than Ms. Ms. Hannah Wald's class or Mr. Gauss. So again, this is something that we know is top of mind with the administrators going through our course and we're also seeing it in our teacher course. In our teacher course, the other thing that we're seeing is teachers who don't know their own value. And so this is something where academic leaders can really help. So teachers are brilliant. We're not supposed to say that people can multitask anymore, and yet I'm going to say that teachers can multitask. An independent school teacher can simultaneously welcome a late student into class, showing them where they need to put their project, while keeping an eye on the two students on the side who are still despondent over a big loss in the state semifinal tournament last night. And they're explaining the hardest problem from last night's homework set while tracking all of the students' eyes to see if the students get this, if there's a small group they need to pull, or if they need a whole class explanation. Oh my gosh, independent school teachers are amazing. 
when you go to the online space, you have to break all of that apart. And you're going to have to help teachers do that because it doesn't come naturally to them. And they don't know their own worth in this case. And so they feel inadequate online in places where they absolutely owned the room before. And so this is a conversation you're going to want to have. Um, there's a new word that I learned in my course, which is nervous sighted. One of the teachers said that about being both nervous and excited to try some of these new things and how to support teachers who are nervous sighted. And there's something that we've talked about a lot and Peter and I debated whether this slide belongs in here. So I'm going to do it real quick. Okay, Peter, because I couldn't leave it out. So my stepdad had a, this is his tool pegboard. It would have looked like this everything. He had a specialized tool for any job that you could need. And oh my gosh, if I borrowed something and didn't put it back in the right spot, boy, was I in trouble. And we need teachers to think and administrators to think more about the chef's nice set so that a chef can take a smaller set of tools and still do everything from making sushi, chopping up really large items, making a radish into a rose, because all of these tools are simplified and can multitask. So thinking about how do we get to the right tool set? And then I'm gonna leave it there. Okay, Peter, <laughs> anything you wanna add? All right. <laughs> and so the last thing that we've learned in listening to academic leaders, all of these academic leaders over the last few weeks is that maybe this is a year to do something really big. So we know that time is of the essence, right? So teachers are having to build online. And so is this the year to say every six weeks, each department is gonna get a week of time to build out what's coming. And so no students will have, for example, social sciences during this week. Well, the social science department works together and says, okay, here are the essentials. Here are our learning objectives for the next six weeks. Everybody's gonna build and support each other. Same thing could happen in second grade. This is, there's a week where your um, social emotional learning and your specials happen the whole week. And those teachers have some time together to think about what, what's gonna happen in second grade. So how can we build that in together? And then Peter, what's the number now of colleges that students won't need a test score to apply to? It's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Probably approaching 2,000 at this point. Uh, every, every day, uh, if you follow FairTest, fairtest.org, they keep the, the sort of the big national and current list of schools that are not requiring uh, standardized tests. Every day, there are more schools added to that list. Uh, it's, right now, there might be fewer schools that are going to be requiring standardized tests. Um, and you can also see from the standardized testing companies, uh, that they're pulling back on the kinds of tests they're offering, how they're offering them, and when they're offering them. So it's, you know, is this this thing that in some ways might have driven us in some ways, maybe it's at least taking a vacation and perhaps in some ways parts of it are going away. So, so is this year to say, okay, we're not going to have any tests? It might be that year. Might be. So we're going to invite you guys to join us. I'm going to stop slide sharing and then I would love to have some folks come in and say, so what's brewing in your mind? What do you think you might want to do this year that you haven't been able to do before? And um, if you're feeling like you don't want to come on camera or with voice, you can put it in the chat, but I'd love to have someone, um, if you click on the, um, or if you just put it in the chat, if you say, you know, pick me, we're going to turn on your voice, or you can go into the attendees and raise a hand, however you want to do that. So I'd love to have some folks share their ideas of what do you want to do this, this year. Oh, and you've got birds tweeting while we wait. We do, we do. We'll practice our wait time because that's hard. And we have a question. What, 
what design principles would guide concurrent learning? Well, I think just to say that, I, I would say right now the, the design principles are keep it simple, set clear goals, and communicate. Sarah may have more to say as well. So this is where you really want to leverage what they have, what students have in common, whether they are at home or they are in the classroom. And so that's where your learning management system is going to be essential. Because even if students are in the room, but you've got a number of students participating by Zoom, the students in the room should have Zoom up on their computer too, so that they can see the classmates who are not there. And you may have a screen somewhere that you're projecting to, but make that, I know who's here in the room with me, visible to everybody. And then as well, you're going to want to leverage your learning management systems discussion feature so that all students are participating together in a written discussion. So thinking about things like that, those are just two sort of off the cuff, but thinking about how do you make it a whole class? So we've got a question here. We're thinking about what we can do around healthy movement in PE since sports are how most of our students get their credit and we're not sure that we can play sports competitively this fall. All right, Peter, put on your AD hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and this one is one where I, I don't think I have very much of an, an answer. Uh, I know that schools are working on ways to, you know, give kids, uh, if you will, in, instructions for how they might be able to exercise or to build, uh, you know, kinesthetic skills and uh, and fitness uh, at home or in their home environment. I think this is an issue which is going to be big <laughs> soon. And uh, I think this is very, very um, difficult, a difficult challenge. Uh, it's also, I will just say, been a conversation on the academic leaders listserv, uh, which will have people on it who can answer this question probably better and more thoughtfully and more from experience than Sarah and I can. So if you're not a member of the Academic Leaders Listserv, uh, oneschoolhouse.org and pull down the Four Educators tab and you can see how to join the Listserv there. But it, this is a great discussion that's going on there right now, actually. And Mark had a comment. It just came to the panelists, so I'm going to share it. But he said, he found it helpful to hear the thought that concurrent instruction design should stem from the distance element and not the other way around. So rather than thinking about how do we take the physical classroom and extend it into the online space for students at home, thinking about what is the online space that we're creating and moving in the other direction there. So really interesting. Oh, and we've got a testimonial for the listserv in the chat too from Beth, who says that she really enjoyed and appreciated the listserv connections and conversations. Yay. We've got one more minute before we are done. And so um, any last observations, comments? <sighs> this year has been really hard, the, the one we've just ended. This summer is going to be brutal the coming school year is going to be really, 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 really hard. I think one of the things that we've learned and, and even where we've sometimes needed to remind ourselves is that this is indeed a global pandemic. The consequences of what's going on, just the medical, the public health situation are horrendous. The consequences of what we are now finally talking about with regard to social justice are horrendous and they are also global. And we need to remind ourselves that this is, this is everybody's problem and everybody's threat. We also need to remind ourselves that the way the world has faced threats of existential proportions before is by teamwork. And that teamwork starts with your academic leadership team. It starts with your faculty thinking and working as a team. You know, it's your board and your faculty and your, and your leadership, all of your leadership together. It's a team effort, guys. And it doesn't mean that we're going to win or that every team will win. Some may not. 
washed Hoosiers. You know, we all cheer for the good guys who win, but then there's that other team. But this is a team effort that we have to put forward. We have to do this work together. We have to, to share and understand what we need as team members working together. We've learned that at one schoolhouse. I've learned that working with Sarah. So, Sarah, your thoughts? Oh, I, I think you just ended that beautifully. We really need to understand each other and know each other's needs and work together to, to meet as many people's needs as we can. We can Thank do this. You. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.